the reality of the human rights council being a political space will um, affect a lot of what maybe the strategy would be around these issues. Um, and but I think um, taking having those who are supportive of um, sexual and reproductive rights taking the opportunities to build relationships and knowledge um, among missions, I think this is really key to ensuring uh, a progressive agenda is possible. Um, I think that uh, a lot of, um, there may be just perhaps a lot of misinformation or um, lack of information a lot of times in terms of positioning around this issue, and I think presentations like that were given today, which can really show the linkages between um, you know, the actual numbers in terms of uh, criminalizing abortion does not lower the numbers, it just makes it less safe. Um, and showing those specific examples I think are really helpful um, in pushing the broader um, political argument that, that has to be made in human rights council spaces. Um, but inevitably it's probably much more I think approach perhaps than, for example, strategic litigation, which my organization does a little bit of. Just to uh, what Spoke Rebecca has said, um, it, it strikes me that I mean, the treaty bodies have developed better regimes groups around abortion rights, but if you look um, you know, 15 years ago, uh, before this jurisprudence started developing, I mean, the treaty bodies were, we just started by asking for information around abortion within specific states, parties, um, in jurisdiction. So I mean, it strikes me when you, you say the incremental approach, that, that seems to be a logical starting point, is, is that the council needs to even show that interest in finding out about the issue, and what is actually happening on the issue through official sources. Um, and, and that seems an important starting point. We see some progress in, in, in UPR. Um, in the first 17 sessions of UPR, there have been about 60, 70 or so UPR uh, recommendations made uh, to states under the EU with respect to advancing uh, abortion rights, and about 25 of those were actually uh, accepted, which is actually a relatively uh, good proportion. However, you have to also look at the fact that there was well over 100 recommendations on abortion rights that were made by UN agencies and by by NGOs within those 17 sessions that received absolutely no reflection within the actual reviews themselves. So there seems to be quite a large number of uh, abortion related recommendations that are, are not being picked up by some by reviewing states or state that review. So there's another thing to take stock of and to, to, to remedy. Would you like to maybe we have time for another round of questions. So, Yes. Hi, uh, Ronnie Johnson from the Bishop. My question is, when we talk about decriminalization of abortion, how specific do we need to be? Valentina mentioned that in Mexico City, abortion is going to be criminalized to 12 weeks. Is that really decriminalization of abortion? Or is it just partial decriminalization? What, you know, if, if the Human Rights Council makes a statement or the NGO makes a statement, what, what's, what's the statement that you want to hear? Just to clarify your question, is, are you saying that the actual maintenance of gestational limit is an example of partial decriminalization? Uh, no, I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but I know that in some places it's decriminalized by gestational age. What, just the question is to the panel, what do we mean, what do you mean when you say decriminalization of abortion? It's taking abortion out of the criminal code, presumably. Is that taking all abortion out of the criminal code? Um, how do you find, define abortion? It's, it's maybe more complex than just saying I have a question. 
constitutional challenge to what was the uh, abortion law at the time. Um, and, and I personally believe that that is um, what criminalization is about. As uh, Jean Paul was saying, it's about removal of abortion and the criminal code altogether, um, regardless of um, gestational age, regardless of uh, reason, because I really don't think. Um, it is just not an issue of judging reasons for why people want to see the motion. Uh, and so, complete removal from the criminal code for one. We've also, and just to tie back into Lucinda's question around positive examples of how this impacts abortion stigma, uh, regular surveys, regular polling is done amongst uh, Canadians around um, their support for the right to, uh, to a to legal abortion. And, and usually, those, those polls come back with. Two thirds of, of Canadians supporting the right, um, so that is quite a, a substantial support. Uh, recent attempts to uh, reopen the abortion debate within the Canadian Parliament have all failed, and we are in a situation where the, uh, the Prime Minister, who, is, as you might know from the uh, Conservative ruling, ruling to the government, um, has uh, had to run the last election on a platform that he would not be reopening the. Debate. So just to tie into losing this question, um, as well as issues of, of forced abortion, um, that's come up as an issue in Canada as well. Um, but our view is that that can also be dealt with um, under existing criminal law. It doesn't need to be a specific law relating to that. Michelle, can you have a question, please? Yeah, I actually had a comment. I wanted to give an example about again, the links between information privacy and abortion uh, which is that you know a lot of us now use smartphones and we sort of have used gps and location data and there have been examples where just having that kind of thing on can indicate that you went to an abortion clinic for example right which might be something that could be potentially dangerous in a country where abortion is illegal or is criminalized. So I just wanted to make the case that when we think of safe and legal abortion in a digital age, particularly safe, we really need to start thinking of how to factor in things like privacy, because abortion could potentially become unsafe just by the information you unwittingly give out through your phones. <coughs> Thanks very much, Michelle. I think you're, you're, that was the last word. Thank you all. Thank you again to our panelists for their presentations and their contributions.